Hi again, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, for those of you that are standing by the back, feel free to take a seat um, right in front if, you're, if, you're, if you like. You can see the screen a little bit better. Okay, so we have a very action-packed agenda today. We have two presentations from portfolio managers from Nico Asset Management. We have a panel discussion with Freddie, our Chief Inve Investment Officer and Co-Founder. And we also have a fireside chat on the metaverse as well. So I'm going to quickly kind of begin by just taking a second to introduce a, an initiative that we launched a couple of months ago. So for those of you that have known Stashway, um, you know, financial education has always been a very important um, topic for us. We launched Stashway Academy a couple of years ago, which is our financial education arm. We do free seminars on financial planning and investing for the public. So a couple of months ago, we wanted to kind of expand on that a little bit more. So we actually wanted to focus on investing for women or helping women in general um, get a little bit more involved in financial financial planning and investment decision making. So we launched our She Invest in initiative, which is a series of masterclass uh, sessions that we host um, every week. So we had one last week, we're going to have one next week as well. So at the end of the session, I'm going to flash uh, next week's session uh, and you can join us if you are available, right? And another thing that I also wanted to quickly take a couple of minutes to introduce is Stashway Reserve. So for those of you that have been with Stashway for a very long time, you know that you know we service kind of the full range of clients from retail investors to kind of high net worth or creditor investors. Uh, and what we wanted to do a couple of months ago is really down, double down on this high net worth segment, okay? And actually launch a couple of more products that are available exclusively for creditor investors, okay? So if you have not heard of the term a creditor investor, this before, uh, feel free to approach us after. We're happy to tell you a little bit more about what that means. Okay. So going back to what I mentioned earlier, we launched uh, Stashway Reserve, which is kind of an, ex an extension of our existing portfolios. You know that you know, we have our global portfolios, which are portfolios of ETFs, globally diversified. We have an income portfolio. We have Stashway Simple or cash management portfolio. But Stashway Reserve is actually an extension of that where we now offer things like private equity, angel investing, uh, VC investing as well, right? All with much lower minimums, uh, much lower kind of entry barriers. So we have representatives from our Stashway Reserve uh, team, our team of wealth advisors at the back. Um, if you are interested to learn a little bit more about Stashway Reserve after the session, feel free to approach any of us, all right? So now that I'm done with uh, a little bit of an update on what we've kind of been up to over the past couple of months, I am going to now uh, maybe quickly invite, what we're going to start off uh, first is to actually have a presentation by Bertram, who is Investment Director and Portfolio Manager at Nico Asset Management. He's going to go through uh, a couple of slides, helping you understand a little bit about what the current economic environment is. As you guys know, markets have been very, very volatile. So a couple of slides just to help understand that and how you can look to position your portfolios a little bit better going forward. All right. So Bertram, I'm going to quickly uh, invite you on and pass on the mic to you. Um, thanks, Amanda. Uh, good uh, evening, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, for a while, I haven't spoken in front of an audience, so it's a good welcome. Uh, I've been used to talking on Zoom, seeing my notes, and so this is more challenging for me. So now I'm talking about fixed income strategies. My name is Bertram. I manage the Singapore dollar fixed income exchange traded funds at Nico Asset Management. And um, I manage two Singapore dollar fixed income ETFs and a China onshore renminbi bond ETF. So. Um, we are going to discuss first the Singapore dollar fixed income market, what are the opportunities here and what we do and how this market has performed in the last few years and where we see it going forward, um, both for the government bond market and for the corporate bond market in Singapore. Uh, this market is around a 200, 250 billion bond market that has seen growth through the years. Um, I've been investing in this market since 2006 before the global financial crisis and also been in the Asia market for quite a long time. I told my colleagues here, I've been working during the global, uh, during the Asian financial crisis in the 90s. So quite a long time before that, I've seen this bond market develop um, more to support local currencies and support capital financing of a lot of the corporates as well as the governments in the region. So in the lower risk front, you have the government bonds in Singapore. Um, this is your um, high quality AAA government bonds. And on the higher risk side, you have your investment grade corporate bonds, giving you additional yield. And, and that's what we offer in our two ETFs currently in Singapore dollar market. 
So on the next slide, you can see where the allocation is for these two exchange traded funds. Um, the first one is the ABF, Singapore Bond Index Fund. It invests primarily in the government bond of Singapore, SGS bonds. So this um, invests in your one year to as long as uh, 20, 50 year bonds. So the longest bond that we hold is actually a Temasek 2071 bond. And um, this continuously invests in SGS and the quasi sovereign bonds. If you look at the yield here, it's around 2.6. Um, for example, um, this is the average across the curve. Um, for example, the recent auction for the Singapore government bond. They issued a 2025 uh, maturity bond um, this month. The yield is around 2.33%. So that's the current level of yields that a three-year bond for Singapore government bonds provide. But for this index, which invests across the full maturity, um, we have a yield of around 2.6%. Um, the duration is around 8. 3% at three years. How do you explain duration? Duration is a measure of interest rate risk. So the higher the duration, the more sensitive a bond or a portfolio of bonds to interest rate risk. So a number eight, for example, if interest rates go up by 1% tomorrow, this portfolio can lose 8%, unfortunately. But if interest rates go down by 1%, then it can gain 8%. That's the price movement. Um, additional income for the portfolio, of course, is the regular coupons that you get from the bonds. Um, the other ETF that we launched in 2018 was focusing on the non-SGS portion of the market. So we have corporates and quasi-sovereign or domestic link companies issuing in this market. Um, a lot of it is still statutory board bonds. Um, HDB is an active issuer. For example, today, um, HDB issued a three-year bond. Um, the yield was around almost 2.7%. Um, so that's on the shorter end of the curve. Um, the other bonds that we see in this market can yield up to 5%, um, probably on the triple Bs um, kind of bonds. Uh, most of the bonds um, in this sector are all on the shorter end if you're a corporate issuer, but we do have um, issues coming from the HDBs and Temasics that are quite long end. LTAs uh, issued a lot of 20-year um, 20, 20 bond, 30-year bond. On. And this is the part of the portfolio that leads to have an average duration of around six, 6.4 years. So that's why, relatively speaking, our corporate bond ETF still has a relatively higher duration because of the statutory boards and thematic issuances in the portfolio. But having said that, you can still see the additional yield of around 3.4%, which is around 80 basis points additional yield um, coming from the credit spreads and the triple Bs and single A bonds that you invest in. These are all investment grade and we do not invest in high yield names. So this has no high yield exposure. So um, on the next slide, this is a historical yield of the government bonds in Singapore. This is an index um, yield history. So this is the average yield of the government bonds in the Singapore um, ABF government bond ETF. So you can see here a historical uh, shift of yields going up and down. And I think I just want to highlight the last four years since 2019. And you can see it picked around 2.8 percent. And um, 2019, we have the U.S.-China trade war. You have the Fed cutting interest rates by around 75 basis points. And then we had 2020, where you had the pandemic in March, where the U.S. Fed cut interest rates by around 150 basis points, bringing yields close to zero. And so we have the index yield almost close to 1 percent. So during that period, when interest rates are going down, you can see a good performance of this ETF. You can see in 2019, it delivered 5 points. 0.1%, 2020, it delivered 8.5%. So it's a good asset class when interest rates are going down and when the, you know, when, when, when the economic outlook is very weak or even on a declining or a recession period. Um, but unfortunately, in the last two years, um, we've seen interest rates going higher. Why? There's economic recovery. In 2021, this is a economic reopening story. Um, you have the vaccination ongoing. And so you had yields go up again. And you can see yields moving up from 1% to almost 2%. You have Delta. And then this year, we have the inflation shock, um, seeing uh, US inflation go up above 8%. And, and so that has led yields 
go up to around 2.7%, close to the historical highs in the last 10 years, um, complicated by oil price hikes, um, oil price increase coming from the uh, Ukraine-Russia um, crisis. And you can see here in the negative performance in the last two years, negative 5 and negative 5.8 um, for these uh, government bonds, supposedly high quality, but it's highly exposed to duration. So that's why it can have negative returns during higher interest rate movement. Um, and the next slide, similar story for the corporate bond ETF. It has higher yield, so currently it's around 3.4%, same direction, going down 2019-2020, you have 5-6% to 6 return, but in the last two years, it's also had slightly negative returns. Um, really, there's been a credit spread that offsets some of the negative returns, that's why 2021, it was still relatively stable, but this year, it still got exposed to the higher movement of interest rates. If you look at the difference between the previous ETF and this one. Um, the, the government bond ETF in the last four years returned 0.6%, and this one uh, returned around 1.6 to 1.9%. So still a good uh, relative outperformance versus that of government bonds. But government bonds perform well when interest rates are really going down. And so in, in the next slide, um, it's more a historical um, perspective of the credit spreads that this corporate bond ETF provides. Um, generally, it adds around 80 basis points to 100 basis points. So on a historical level, if you invest in the corporate um, bond sector in Singapore, um, because this includes the HDB bonds, which has a very tight spread of around 20 basis points or 0.2%, um, the average additional spread pickup that you can get from corporates around 80 basis points to 100 basis points. Um, some bonds can have around 200 basis points up. We do invest in a lot of the go, uh, bank perps uh, that are included in this from DBS, from OCBC, those do yield attractively from a credit spread perspective. So that's more on the Singapore dollar bond market. So in a rising interest rate environment where we have seen in the last two years, a lot of investors like uh, from a lot of our clients also look at shorter shortening their duration. So um, from an eight year to six year duration, we go decrease our duration so that you reduce the impact of rising interest rates. So here, this is our short duration Asia credit strategy. Um, we invest in both Singapore dollar bonds and US dollar bonds. We hedge it fully to Singapore dollars and the average duration we target within three years. In the last um, one year, we've been having a duration of one to two years. So that's a very low duration reducing the impact, as I mentioned earlier, of interest rates. So you can see in the last um, four years on average, um, this is around 1.9%. Um, it has been positive from 2019 to 2021. Although this year, despite our low duration, the sharp rise um, in interest rates still impacted it, the fund uh, negatively, but it's only around minus 1%, which we expect can be recouped from the coupon that's being received by the portfolio. So you can see in the next slide, this is the average yield of the fund. Um, it's around 3.4% currently. So this is, for, for me personally, is historically attractive for an investment grade, um, short duration um, credit strategy. So that provides you with enough cushion in case um, interest rates go higher or further um, in the next few months, um, given the Fed is still hiking interest rates. Um, you still have inflation uncertainty. Um, we still don't know where oil prices may still pick up from where it is. Uh, we've seen it go to as high as 120 level again today. So there's still a number of uncertainties in the market. That's why strategies like a short duration strategy can offset the impact of rising interest rates and rising inflation. Mm -hmm. And the last strategy that I'd like to pick up as well is um, our China government bond and policy bond strategy. Um, the thing with China government bonds is they behave differently from developed market bonds. Um, in the last three years, 2019 to 2021, they were actually a good diversifier for global investors. Um, China bonds, so a lot of inflows. And so if you look at this four years, the average return of China bonds in Singapore dollar terms is around 5%. 
So that's a good um, diversifier for a developed market bond investor. Um, although this year you can see a slight negative, um, from a bond perspective, they're still positive. Some of the negative returns that came here is from a currency perspective. But from a renminbi perspective, I'd say in the short, in the long term, it's relatively a stable currency compared to your, let's say, your euro or your Japanese yen. So from a volatility perspective, a renminbi is still, for me, a relatively lower foreign bond exposure because of the relative stability of the renminbi from a volatility perspective. So yeah, this is more the summary of what I've said. Government bonds are your safe haven instruments. They perform well on a crisis period. If you are in a crisis mode, you go into government bonds and you avoid it when interest rates are going up. And corporate bonds, of course, gives you that additional spread, performs better than government bonds in the long term. And short duration strategies avoid the movement interest, interest rates higher. And as what I've said, actually interest rates have significantly adjusted. They're now at historical highs. And for medium to long-term investors who look at bonds as a safer investment, um, relatively, it's a lower volatility asset class. It's a good entry level uh, based on the historical um, history of yields so far. Um, lastly, you have the China government bonds as a consideration to diversify your fixed income portfolio. So right. that's it from my end. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Bertrand, for the insights. Maybe I can invite you to have a seat as we we're about to start the panel discussion. So uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much for those insights, Bertrand. I think it sets a great base for us to further that even more in the panel coming up. All right. So maybe what I'm going to do now is also invite um, our chief investment officer and co-founder, Freddie, uh, up on, on stage, not really a stage, <laughs> up here in front. All right. So yeah, I think you know we have a couple of people also tuning in online on via webinar. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post it in the uh, Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, what I'm going to do is set a good amount of time towards the end of the panel discussion for both Bertram and Freddie to answer your questions. And also for the audience that is tuning in live as well, feel free to raise your hands uh, later on during the Q&A. We'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. So maybe just to kick things off, I have a question for uh, both Bertram and Freddie, which is you know really just to begin with what we're seeing really a lot of every day and what everyone is pretty much talking about, right? We're seeing persistent inflation, increasing interest rates as a result of that. Uh, is the current environment heading towards stagflationary growth? I know we've not seen that for quite some time. So what are your views on that, first of all? Uh, and are we in a late cycle? Uh, and what are some of the key risks to the outlook for the remainder of the year? I know there's three parts to that question. So maybe we can address the st stagflationary growth first. Hang on a minute. Is yeah. this the first question? Yes. <laughs> it sounds like the conclusion, you know. <laughs> All right. Maybe we can address the, the more kind of stagflationary to, growth first. Just repeat the first part. Okay, yeah. We'll one by one. So we've seen persistent inflation, increasing interest rates. Uh, so do you see kind of based on what's happening right now in the current environment, are we heading towards stagflationary growth? Um, there's a bit of a feedback loop. Um, you have inflation now. Everybody knows that. Market is pricing it quite fully, quite aggressively for the Fed uh, rate hike cycles. So what we have said today is nothing new, right? What's new is what's going to drive markets. So what's new could be Russia-Ukraine ceasefire, could be China, uh, you know, no longer committing to or loosening the zero COVID restrictions, that will reduce impact on supply chain disruptions that, that help alleviate inflation, right? So we just need any signals like that, that we'll see leading indicators of inflation to start just softening. And that was enough to just make the market stabilize. So this, this bar is quite low because most of the noises are out there. So I just want to put it out there first. Um, and in terms of... Um, Stagflation or not, it really depends. Um, I'll, I'll conclude first. I don't think the Fed wants to drive a recession, right? They work so hard to get us out of the pandemic uh, crisis, but they do need to fight inflation. And this inflation is not due to food or energy prices, not, not vegetable prices. These are, they, if you strip out those impacts, you actually see core inflation, wages. There's a lot of heating that's going on. And they need to slow that. And what better time is it to do now when the money multiplier, the, the velocity of money is actually at all time low. This is a time they have to do, otherwise they would never do. 
and they have never done for the last 15 years. They've been saving the markets every single time. The balance sheets ballooned to 9 trillion, 8.9 trillion to be precise. They, I mean, so really nothing is new. And all is out there, and yet the market has only gone for a pretty small market correction, right? It's not like we are in a crisis or the bear market. So that's the good news I have. If I look forward, I think the probability, you point a gun at me, is this deflation? I say my base case is not, um, unless Russia, Ukraine goes nuclear. Yeah. Bertrand, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, for, from my end, um, I, I look at data on a regular basis. So my my feel is that um, we've seen inflation um, sort of eased a little bit. So we've seen some core PCE deflator um, go um, slightly lower. Um, we've seen break-even inflation, which is a measure of market expectations of infl inflation, um, east from its peak. So I think that's sort of a, a, a sort of a, a green shoot positivity that inflation may have peaked. Some of our market participants or even some of our PMs saying, "Oh, inflation may have peaked." And and the other part that I'd like to take um, maybe um, anchor from is the Fed's commitment. So um, the Fed is committed towards bringing inflation back down to 2% level. And they have shown that by saying they've going to be aggressive with their monetary policy hikes. I think the risk of stagflation is if the Fed fails, um, wherein they, they are hiking interest rates without being able to um, bring inflation down. But the unemployment has gone up. So that's where you have a stagflation scenario. Um, hopefully it's a soft landing. Um, that's where I'm hoping. And I think the risk for stagflation, I would agree, will be lower, but the market is pricing it in. Um, but having said that, you've seen it um, price less. Uh, you've seen yields from a peak of 3.2 for the 10 year. It's gone down this week to around 2.75, 2.8. So that's sort of an indication that um, the expectation expectation that inflation is going to ease, you've seen that in easing of, of the 10-year yield. Fair enough. I think it still remains to be seen and a couple of trigger factors has to happen yeah, for the, that. The, to, the risk to is, the case. I, I've, I've talked to my um, credit analyst, is that when oil becomes unhinged, um, currently it's around 110 to 120. Um, I ask him, is it going to 150 or 200, this embargo stories and that. I think that's a scenario that can be quite negative and lead to stagflation risk because that's outside the control of the Fed. Fair enough. All right. So, I mean, in line with, I guess, today's topic also, I, I'm going to hold off second the second part of that question later, Freddie, for, for the end. Maybe I have a question for you right now, uh, which is really, I guess, to focus a little bit more on where you see treasury yields going. Right now, it's really kind of reached a peak, uh, a peak of 3.2% um, with the Fed still kind of to hide a couple more times this year. So what is your outlook on, on where yields are going to go? Or do you think it's a little bit too early to tell right now? I, I think it's it, it, um, my my portfolio managers and myself. We think it's gonna peak somewhere um, around this second quarter. Um, it, it's gone to around two point seventy five, two point eight. It really depends on the inflation momentum. You see month on month data, and also the um, the oil prices that can spike. Have you seen EU inflation being quite high, around eight or eight percent higher? So there can still be room to move it back up to three percent. But that, that can be the range where we're moving around from around 2.7 to 3.2%. So I think that's the range we'll be playing around uh, at least in the next few months, I think. Well, I mean, if you just look at long-term uh, inflation, the Fed assumption is 2% and uh, growth is 2% added together. 4% is something that for long-term rate is very tolerable. So we're on our way to get there. Uh, hopefully it's a smooth way to get there. So your level is not too far-fetched. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. So I guess, Bertram, we talked a little bit earlier about duration, right? So I'm just going to kind of drill down on that a little bit. Right? So when looking at duration, I guess short duration is favored in the rising interest rate environment. Um, but we're, if we're near the peak in use, 
Um, would this mean that we need to start adding duration back to portfolios? Yeah, um, personally, uh, I would look at the current level of yields as quite attractive. That's from a historical level. Um, I look at the government bonds um, on a safer side um, as an allocation to hedge potential recession risk, um, potential decline in the economy later on. So I would start looking at a long duration strategy um, to, to hedge this some of this uh, recession risk, growth decline risk. So that's my consideration in case I allocate to bonds. Um, but having said that, there's still that inflation risk that we've been talking about. So I may be holding back a little um, as I start to allocate. But if I'm a single bond investor, I would look at the three-year bond, the five-year bond, as I mentioned earlier, um, for governments or even for high-quality corporates as bond that I would allocate to. Okay. All right. Um, so just kind of, I guess, to follow on a little bit more on that uh, when it comes to allocation, right? I think for the past, uh, you know, couple of decades, you know, the typical 60-40 model portfolio is, is, is something that has been talked about quite a bit, right? So do you think that, you know, um, this typical 60-40 split is going to work as well going forward? What are your views on that? Um, so how, and I guess as a follow-up to that, how do you view fixed income uh, within an investment portfolio in the current environment? Um, uh, the 60-40 the, the works well when you have quantitative easing, right? Because both stocks and bonds were, were supported by the Fed and to the tune of 8.9 trillion, that's a balance sheet. So that day, those days are over. Um, we're in quantitative tightening, right? It would take the Fed to reduce it, what, uh, 1.2 trillion a year to get it back down to natural level of around 4 trillion. You, you take a couple of years, right? So they're not going to stop doing that. So the 60-40 would be more challenged today. And it's probably by design. I think the Fed is trying to force everyone to go invest in growth and rather apologies, but uh, rather than to be in protective assets because uh, that's not what they want to see. And this, the policies, fighting inflation, making bonds unattractive, is all a part of the grand, grand, grand plan to grow your way out, right? So investors really have a tough decision because ultimately, what do I do, right? The bond market not looking good, but we'll work well in a market crashed. Uh, and then I still need to invest in long-term growth if I'm a young person. So ultimately, it all comes back to where you are in your life cycle. If I'm a young person, I can take more risks. You are, you're more naturally going to have more equity, like more growth-oriented assets, right? Someone like me, uh, maybe 60-40 would work quite close to what I want. Uh, I'm not sure about Bertrand, he's, he's young at heart, so it's probably 90% equities, right? So, <laughs> so, so uh, it really depends. Just go back to your investment plans, your financial goals, your own age, life cycle, and make that plan for the next 30 years and stick to it. And that over time, you review it because as you get older, you will get more income generating assets. And we're very lucky in Singapore that there's a lot of high quality uh, income generating assets, uh, especially in the risk space. The risk space is very interesting right now. They use high quality. They're, we're reopening, right? So uh, are we going to mutate our way to a softer virus? It's going to reopen anyway. So it, it seems like income strategy is also attractive if you're patient enough, right? So go back to your age, go back to your plans. Uh, that's your allocation. Yeah. Bertram, any I mean, from my perspective, it, um, allocation is always, um, you know, moving around. Um, I'm not a 60-40 person. I, I move around my allocation depending on the market risk, the market environment. So in a way, I, I do believe diversification is always important. Um, I, I'm not an expert in terms of market timing. So if I, if I want a diversified portfolio, I would just... Um, Diversify depending on my, as you say, your age, maybe if you're young, you might go more equities. Um, but if you're more equities, um, I think your fixed income allocation will be small. So there might be not so much diversification there, but maybe a good bond, um, government bond allocation is good enough. But if you have a lot of fixed income allocation in your portfolio, then that's where you have more diversification that you need that can cover across market cycles. So you will have credits in your portfolio, you have long duration, you have short duration, 
position, or you might diversify across geography, as I mentioned with China bonds. So if you have a, a big enough um, fixed income allocation, that's where you need diversification within that fixed income allocation. Yeah. So maybe let's just kind of dive a little bit deeper on that diversification topic and using fixed income um, to do so, right? So I think we have tuning in today, you know, people of different ages, people of different risk appetites, risk profiles. How should, what are some of the key things or factors people should keep in mind, key rules of thumb, I, I would say, people should keep in mind as they are looking to, um, I guess, diversify their portfolio of fixed income. So how should they go about thinking about it, depending on your preferences? Yeah, um, having said that, I've always say that bonds and equities are good diversify, um, diversify each other. But um, in the last few months, it hasn't. They moved down together. And and probably it's because of the QE that you mentioned. It has distorted the tradition. It lasts forever. It's, yeah. it's, it's so one, once the QE is gone or quantitative tightening is gone, maybe the classic bonds versus equities, low correlation stuff will work again. But um, and, and then uh, within fixed income, um, Fixed income is a lower volatility asset class. So if you have low risk appetite, you will probably more have fixed income in your portfolio. And within that fixed income, you can tilt your portfolio depending on market conditions. Um, if it's a economic risk of environment, recessionary, that's where you put in more government bonds with long duration. But if in, in the scenario where it's high inflation, you might go down to um, lower duration or even cash. And then in the mid cycle where the economy is strong, you want to pick up, then you go into credits and you have more risk appetite, might even go high yield. Bertram had a very nice slide earlier that summarizes everything in our fixing in our Singapore income portfolio. Um, I don't know if you want to find that, but it basically he went government bonds and then go higher risk and then higher you. I would get out of the way for people to try to maybe one of the early slides, right? Yeah, one of your that that hit me quite a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, that one. So you were saying, right, like it, it really depends on the person. If I'm older and also more risk averse, I'll be more over here and a little bit here. I'm a younger person, even within fixed income, I may go, risk, risk is missing here. A real estate investment trust is probably somewhere around here. And maybe I'll go a bit high you and, and, and all that. And then I can use geography to try to diverse Diversify that because high U has higher rates of uh, 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 accidents happening too. So, so it's really a function of risk. U and risk is this this linear relationship, relationship long term, and you you still at the end of the day have to ask yourself where I am, where I am today, and hence how can I make a combination of this that reflects my risk level, right? So that that's why I'm trying to say this this is a very key one. You can add on other things here, but the, the concept's the same. Yeah. No, perfect. Thank you so much, Freddie. All right. So hopefully, I mean, that's something actionable for, for investors today to, I guess, take home um, and think about a little bit more about for, for your portfolios, right? So, um, you know, I think one of the, I would say, main concerns for a lot of investors, I think it's been talked about quite a bit, is that year to date, you know, it's we've seen one of the worst performance, worst start to the year since the Great Depression. As you mentioned earlier, fixed income and equities going down in unison. Uh, it's tough, right? For investors, you try and diversify, but you have both of them going down. So I guess going forward for the rest of the year, and, and, and you know, there is talk about a possible recession as well. So in your point, what, you know, I guess in your point of view, what are some of the key what are some of the key risks, first of all, and, and what is your outlook in general um, going forward? Yeah, I'll start first. I think the, the key risk, um, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, is still the, the idea that the Fed may have difficulty in taming inflation. And so whatever is priced in currently, for example, we've mentioned seven, seven more hikes this year, um, it might even be higher. And, and they might need, even need to hike some more. And the question is, will it be effective enough? So that's the key risk. And, and so inflation going haywire is, is a risk uh, that I'm concerned with. But having said that, hopefully the Fed can, can, can address it. And, and so from a strategy perspective, going on a shorter duration strategy is still a good strategy. In terms of economic recovery, we mentioned earlier, it's a late stage. In Asia, we're still not in that late stage. A lot of countries are still starting to reopen. So I think from a credit perspective in the region, there's still a lot of, of credit opportunities, um, especially on the investment grade front. Um, yeah. Ready? Any any thoughts on that? 
Um, well, I, I, I'll, I'll put out something differently. Uh, let, let's see what happens. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, if today's stock market, the P ratio is 20 times, it means that the market is giving you uh, a pricing that's equivalent to a 20 year bonds. The bond has a coupon equal to the expected forward earnings per share that the market expects, right? Now, if you're in peak earnings cycle, earnings are able to improve further. If you believe that's a story, Increase in interest rate will now in a discounted manner because a $1 in 30 years from now is not the same in present value, right? If you have peak earnings and those coupon that's moving based on growth is now stagnated and the increase in interest rates because of hikes will do more damage to the equity markets. So that means um, you according to my quick calculation, 1% increase in 20 year rate onward will give you a 16% drop in the stock markets. Sounds familiar? We've just been there and came back, right? So that's sort of what the market is tussling with right now. Uh, earnings potential. Is it stagnating? Interest rates rising in response to inflation. So it created a lower present value of those future earnings, right? So that's a framework we think. If you are a pessimistic person, there's nothing I can say to tell you that a human nature is in human's nature to grow, disrupt, innovate, given enough time, that earnings potential will never be stagnating. You look at any charts in financial markets, 10 years ago, we always have a historical high. And if that's the reason to stop you from investing, 10 years later today, you'll be missing a huge amount of returns, right? So again, I want to go back to fundamentals, which is given enough time, it's in our human nature on this earth, in this universe to grow, to innovate. So that is the key. Interest rate is only like a smoothing mechanism. It's not a, a trend setting thing. Oh, because of rate hikes, we're going to go recession. That, that has never really happened. It can create higher volatility in the near term for a couple of months, but it has never, it never in the Fed's intention to create a recession. It's not their job, right? So uh, I want to just come back to this and say, guys, you know, be optimistic. You know, we have a track record of success as a human species, right? Given enough time, it will play. It. You want to grow your portfolio, you need time in the market to compound. So stick with that 30 year plans. All these are, whatever we say today, they're just noises. They're just to help you get in, into the know, but doesn't mean it's uh, an investment decision or investment strategy, right? So I'll just put it out there. Yep, sounds Not good. answering the question. Yeah, but no, something for everyone to ponder, to think about. Yeah, no, for, thank you so much, Freddie. Um, all right, so I think we have one last question before uh, we can end off this panel discussion. We still have uh, another presentation and a fireside chat as well. I think one thing that we've heard a lot about recently is, you know, talk about crypto, talk about wine investing, talk about a lot of alternatives, like even private equity, you know, venture capital, all of these private investments. So I guess for your typical investor, or, you know, I guess we can look at it both ways, for retail investors as well as maybe accredited investors, how would you say they should look about go about diversifying their, their, their portfolios across these public market investments as well as the private markets? I'm more of a fixed income expert. I have a bias of buy more fixed income. But <laughs> so uh, uh, from my end, just allocate the fixed income is, is my the end. Trans, that's how but it's going to from, be. Huh? From a personal perspective, um, I'm not in that space. I have a small crypto fund, but that's it. <laughs> Uh, I'm assuming what at least uh, what's the Singapore stats? Twenty percent of people have a crypto uh, account, right? Yeah, I'm something be like that. Yeah, yeah. very forward-looking. Um, uh, the society. Um, I, I think everything is an allocation, right? Uh, crypto or not, alternative or not. The first thing I would advise is your liquidity profile. Like, for example, uh, I'm a young person. Maybe I still need to keep six months maybe 12 months of monthly allowances, right? If I don't have a job, I have something to fall back. Your safety net fund is number one. It's not investing. It's actually your safety net funds. If I'm an older person, everybody depend on me. I need maybe larger number of months. If I'm an entrepreneur, I'm on my own, maybe even two years or three years of, 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 of living expenses, right? So sort out your plans for your rainy day fund. Um, and then, then you talk about investments. Then when you get to talk about investing step two, then is what is the right risk level for me. It's very difficult. I can tell you, oh, it's a statutory risk index. 
it says there's a 1% chance of you losing 20% of the money in any given time. What does that mean? Meditate on it. Close your eyes. Okay, tomorrow drop 20%, a surprise. How am I going to react? Um, if I choose a high-risk portfolio and it's 50% risk, tomorrow is going to be half. Feel it. And how much it takes from half to go back to a square? 100% return, right? So that tells you there's a boundary, how far you want to take risk over because the hurdle is going to get very high. So figure your risk level and then commit to that particular risk point and split your investments every month based on what you can save, right? After expenses. As simple as that. I've been saying this for five years, just this three-step plans, it hasn't changed. Yeah. I really like the meditate on it. I like, I like that. Okay. Yeah, no, for sure. All right. So I think that's it for the panel discussion. I'm just going to maybe see if anyone has any questions before I let uh, my two very esteemed panelists go. Does anyone have any questions um, in the audience? Check those. Okay, so I don't think we have any questions for now. Just a quick reminder, if you do, and if you're tuning in on Zoom, please feel free to post it in the Q&A box. Thank you so much, Freddie. Thank you so much, Bertram. Time uh, for I the cool kids. Yes, so yeah, <laughs> time for the cool kids. Time for the, I guess, a much talked about topic. Yeah, uh, so no, thank you both so much. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the next topic that we have is something that we just wanted to quickly kind of also uh, squeeze in a little bit. I think it's something that a lot of people have heard a lot about the metaverse, right? Hearing meta going into metaverse. And I think it's a topic that a lot of people are not super kind of familiar with. So we thought because this is an educational webinar, we wanted to squeeze this in as well. So I'm going to quickly invite uh, Ashwin, who is a portfolio manager at Nico Asset Management as well. He's going to go through a couple of slides. Once again, set a good base for us before we jump into a fireside chat. All right, um, Ashwin, just inviting you, not on stage, once again to the front. There you go. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. This is good. Yes. This one. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ashwin. Um, I'm part of the equity team at Nico. Uh, Bertram does the serious stuff. I do the funny stuff, which everyone else has a view on. Um, so one of the things that obviously is topical, and uh, you know, if you haven't heard the, the phrase metaverse in the last three months, you've definitely been living under a rock. Um, it's, it's one of those things that everyone wants to talk about and everyone has a view. Um, and most people don't know what they're talking about, uh, including me, to be honest. Uh, but it's one of those things where, you know, you're paid to have a view, so we have a view. Um, could we just go to the next? So I, I, I just thought I'd start with setting the scene, which is what exactly is the metaverse, right? I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, because it's in such a nascent stage of evolution, um, there's more misinformation and disinformation than actual information out there. Um, so what I think you should do is, is just get a sense of what it actually is and, and equally what it is not uh, to form your own opinion on, on where you think this goes and how quickly it evolves and how quickly it matures. Um, so basically, you know, these are what are considered on the, on the left side, these seven points are what are considered essential to something being truly called a metaverse. Uh, so what does that really mean? Persistent basically means it's always on. Um, so it's not something that's up for six hours and then switched off and then comes back on, right? Live and synchronous is, is like this webcast, right? So everyone online is looking at me live, talking nonsense or talking sense, but it's live. And, and what it means is anyone watching this program anywhere in the world is seeing exactly the same thing. And that's important because in, in most simulations, what you see, even in, in very funky video games with phenomenal graphics, not everyone is seeing the exact same thing. Um, you, you are seeing a version that's been cached that's probably at a server that's in Changi. Uh, someone in Toronto is seeing something that's been cached in, in Toronto. and there is a difference, a small difference. It may not be a phenomenal difference, but there is a small difference between what that person seeing and what I'm seeing out here. Uh, so it's not synchronous. It's actually two different instances of nearly the same thing. 
Um, massively scalable is critical because it basically means that if you want a world where everyone's in the metaverse, you're going to have to cater to 6 billion people. Um, and, you know, either you play games yourself or you have kids who play games, you know, everyone's on Fortnite. Well, maybe Fortnite's passe now. No one talks about Fortnite anymore. But even in, in a game like Fortnite, for instance, you each game is limited to 100 people or 100 competitors. Uh, which means it's you can have a thousand versions of that game running, and each one of those thousand versions would have a hundred people, which means you have a hundred thousand people playing the game, but they're not all playing the same game. They're all playing games of a hundred each. So there are a thousand different versions of the same game playing. So it's not actually massively scalable. Uh, in, in a true metaverse, basically all those 100,000 people could be playing the exact same game. They could be watching a concert. They could be uh, playing a video game inside the metaverse. They could be doing any number of things. Um, so that's why that massively scalable part is critical. Um, it has a fully functioning economy. So put it simplistically, if you want the metaverse to mimic the real world, it has to do what everyone does in the real world. You should be able to buy a coffee. You should be able to go work. You should be able to go shopping. You should be able to meet your friends. So effectively, it is the real world. So it has to have an economy the same way you would have in the real world. So you pay for something, you get something in return. Uh, interoperability is critical because if you have, you know, I go and make something and then you go and make something and the two of our systems can't talk, it's pointless. So then you don't have a metaverse, you have a hundred billion microverses, which doesn't really help. Um, three dimensional. Um, so this is where we have the biggest hurdle right now because we're a very, very long way from getting a truly three dimensional world. Um, you have HoloLenses and you have, uh, you know, all of those different devices that currently let you experience three-dimensional virtual worlds, but they're very clunky. They give you motion sickness. You can only do it for half an hour to 45 minutes, maybe an hour and a half if you've got a truly beta version that's been souped up. Um, so that's that's the real major hurdle right now. Uh, and, and data continuity. So think of it this way. So if I played a game today, I'm, I'm just using game as an example because it's the most intuitive example. It doesn't have to be a game. Uh, let's say I'm playing a game today, um, say Fortnite. I've won Victory Royale. I've earned myself uh, V-Bucks. Um, and I want to use it in some other game. Today, I can't because whatever I've done exists within the confines of Fortnite. So if I go and play another game and I bring, win something else there, and it could be Robux, uh, Robux in the Roblox environment, I can't take that Robux and use it in Fortnite. I can use it in that ecosystem only. And so you need, in a true metaverse, because it's supposed to be seamless, I should be able to use this there and that here, including not just the money, including the character. So if I look like a, um, you know, a spandex wearing mohawk sporting uh, man in his 20s, while I'm in reality this, I should be able to look like that in anything I choose to in the metaverse. I shouldn't have to change because I'm going in some other environment. I don't. I shouldn't have to change. Uh, so those are the criteria. So now you can imagine with all these really, once you take all these into account, you can really imagine how far we are from the metaverse today. Um, while everyone's talking about it, like it's just around the corner. It's happening three months down the road. It's happening six months down the road. No, we're at least six years away, maybe even further, right? Um, no, sorry. Can we just go back? Um, but this is all well and good. So it, it, what you want to think about it is in, in terms of what you need to get there is if you look at it like an onion where you've got a core and then you've got multiple layers. And so what everyone talks about gaming exists literally in that layer. It's the outermost layer. And to make that happen, you have a whole bunch of other things. So if you're thinking about gaming, for instance, you've got computers, you've got data storage, you've got GPUs, you've got cloud, you've got fiber networks. Um, you've got a, if you're playing on the mobile phone, you've got a 4G or a 3G or a 5G network. All of those things are happening today to let you experience that gaming. So can you imagine all of those things happening to let you do it in a three-dimensional virtual world that's seamless, that exists globally, and where, you know, it, you can be anywhere and play or talk to anyone or work anywhere else. So those are the different things that you really need uh, to make it happen. The other thing that's being sort of thrown around is, is Web 3.0. Um, and it's, it's uh, 
very loosely thrown around like it's, you know, oh, Web3, Web3, Web3. Something to think about. So Web Web 1.0 was basically the very, very basic version that came about in the last century. Um, web 2.0, so, so think about Web 3.0 as a read-only, uh, Web 1.0 as a read-only version. So someone put up something, you could just go see what was on that web page, right? Um, so you had static web pages and you had links from one web page to another. Web 2.0 let you read and write. So you could see somebody's content, but you could also post content of your own. So that's read, write, that's web 2.0. Web 3.0 is basically read, write, and in, in, in computer lingo, basically you're executing, but you can, basically what that means is you own stuff. So not on, today, because if I go to a website, someone controls that website, it's not me. So even though I put a comment on that website or I put a post on that website or I put an image on that website, it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to that website. So the website can do whatever they want with that stuff. In a, in a web 3.0 world, what it's designed to do is if I create something, I own that thing and no one else has a right to it. I can choose to give that right to someone else. It can be a transaction. I can pay for it. Someone can buy it off me or we can agree a, an exchange in terms, whatever it is. But I have sole access and control over that content. Uh, so web 3.0 basically is critical in a world where you have the metaverse, which is completely interoperable and you have data continuity. Because if I create something sitting on a farm in Bali um, and I want to sell it to someone sitting in Timbuktu, how does that person know I have control? So you need the infrastructure that goes under it. And so simplistically think of Web 3.0 as that infrastructure that lets it happen. So you need all of these different bits and bobs to, to come together to get to a stage where it becomes feasible for the metaverse to exist. Um, the next slide. So this is just to give you a sense of those, those layers of the onion. So that's the center of the onion. This is the outermost layer. And this is just to give you a sense of which companies are involved in what space. And there's a whole bunch of these people, right? And there are companies doing different things in different parts. So I mean, Fortnite, you know, uh, but you have someone like Microsoft, which is involved in multiple steps of the process, for instance, right? Um, and, and, you know, Activision, Blizzard, you know, gaming company, everyone knows about it. Um, you know, um, there's Epic somewhere here, which I'm sure you've heard of. So, so Fortnite is, is by Epic, but Epic also makes a gaming engine, uh, which, which comes under the, the spatial computing bit. And, and so this is just to give you a sense of who is involved in what, and there are a hundred other companies that are also involved in all of this stuff. Uh, if you go to the next one, please. So if you just looked at all those companies and you tried to sort of make some sense out of who's doing what and, and what buckets do you fit these companies into. This is our attempt at sort of simplifying it into seven buckets, right? Um, so think of companies that are producing the hardware. So this is the guys that make the consoles, uh, the, the Nintendo consoles or the PlayStation consoles or whatever it is. Uh, think of computing. So this is the GPU guys. So an NVIDIA, for instance, or the guys who are making the chips. Um, connectivity bandwidth intuitive. So, you know, it could be a local telecom company. It could be Amazon Web Services, so AWS Cloud or Microsoft Cloud, for instance. Uh, platforms. So this would be someone like a Tencent, for instance, that's, that's fairly well known. Um, tools, because you need a whole bunch of things that, that make that possible. So cybersecurity, all of those things, if you can think about them. Uh, payments. So now you're no longer just talking about fiat currency. You're talking about central bank digital currencies. You're talking about cryptocurrencies. You're talking about um, uh, in-game tokens. Uh, and, and you could be talking about any number of these combinations interacting with fiat currencies as well. Um, and, and then obviously content, which is that experience layer, if you will, uh, in terms of it could be games, it could be movies, it could be education, it could be healthcare, it could be any number of things. Um, the next... One, please. So this is just to give you a sense of you know what possible applications you could have for something like the metaverse in its true form. Um, so literally, I mean, any particular activity you can think of, you could do it in the metaverse, and the metaverse could make it more rich, more uh, location agnostic, more income agnostic, any number of those things, right? So the, the, the applications are limitless. Um, and, and there are obviously some that are more intuitively amenable to the metaverse. There are some that will sort of potentially 
take a little while longer to mature and come there. So that's just to give you a flavor for how the metaverse could affect different sectors in different parts of the world and, and which ones happen earlier, which ones happen later. So obviously, you know, this Travis Scott had this big concert within uh, Fortnite. And, and in fact, I think Ariana Grande did as well. And these were hundreds of millions in, in audience. And, and he obviously made a truckload of money. Um, you know, equally, you've had Little Nas X uh, also in, in Roblox do a, do a concert. So, you know, these are happening already. So, you know, music, TV, film, this is already happening. Um, anyone who's seen the latest uh, Doctor Strange movie, I mean, just this, the rendering of the movie, I mean, that's all done using gaming engines. We're a very, very long way from blue screens and, and doing basic sort of cinematic physical acrobatics. Um, everything's done using gaming engines. So it's either the Unreal 5 engine or, uh, or, or you're using a, a Unity engine at the back of it. And, and in fact, Harley Davidson did an ad uh, of a new bike that they launched, I think, two years ago um, during COVID, where the entire ad was shot using a gaming engine. Um, yeah, the bike was real, though. Um, so this is the, this is the last point I just want to leave you with, um, because I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, in our view, Asia will be the center of, uh, of this metaverse, uh, because you, you have aging populations in the U S you have aging populations in Europe, you have an aging population in Japan. Um, so really the young population that is digitally native, that has the money to spend, that is familiar with all of this sits in Asia. Um, and, and as you can see here, I mean, you know, the numbers are just staggering out there. Um, you know, 300 million female gamers in China alone, for instance, um, you know, says she invests. So I, I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, but, but I mean, gaming in, in general, um, as a whole, 45% of gamers are women. So it's, it's one of the few, you know, industries, if you will, where, uh, women are sort of standing toe to toe with men. Um, and the empowerment that comes because this is no longer a physical activity, right? I mean, you, you don't have to punch someone, you don't have to kick someone, it's, it's skills. Uh, it, it's a great equalizer, if you will. Um, so in our view, Asia is going to be where the center is. It's just the sheer demographics. It's the incomes. Um, these are countries that have leapfrogged technology compared to Western markets. So, I mean, a lot of Asian countries started at 3G. Um, from from having no mobile infrastructure, whereas you know the Western world went from fixed line to 2G to 3G to 4G, etc. Um, so you've had that advantage. Um, these countries are getting richer pretty quickly. There's a lot of wealth creation, and a lot of that disposable income gets deployed into activities like this. Um, so from that perspective, we think this is really where the action is going to be over the next uh, next 10 years. So watch the space. That's pretty much all I had. Um, anyone can shoot any questions or Amanda can. Uh, we do actually have a couple of questions, so maybe I can invite you to have a seat, Ashton. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for those insights. I think uh -huh. there are a couple of people in their 20s probably really connecting your view of all the Travis Scott, Lil Nas X and, and Ariana Grande uh -huh. there. Yeah. I had to throw that in because uh, it's, it's, I'm a bit of an anachronism. I'm, a, I'm in the wrong generation to be talking about this stuff. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, we, we did have a couple of questions come in and, you know, I think earlier on you flashed quite a number of companies that are involved within the metaverse ecosystem. So I guess for something that's a little bit more actionable for investors today, if they're looking to kind of pick or, if, you know, choose to invest in some of these companies, how do you go about evaluating them? What are some of the key things you should keep in mind? Um, I think one should bear in mind with all of these thematics, not just the metaverse, but anything that's long dated, that's in its nascent phase, that's, you know, and that's going to take time to mature. Um, it, it, it's, it's actually a phrase that Freddie mentioned, time in the markets, uh, as opposed to timing the markets is critical. Um, if you want to get involved with something like this now, you have to take a view that you will not be touching that money for the next 10 years. Because in three years time, if you look at this and say, oh, this is actually down 10%, this is down 15%, I've just wasted three years doing nothing, and you pull it out, you would have done the exact wrong thing. Um, you do have to take with these things, you do have to take the long view. Uh, and if you don't want to, or you think you can do better, then you're actually better off doing that. Uh, because if you put your money in here and three years later, you run out of patience and get out, uh, 
it's going to be a waste. A, a classic example is electric vehicles, right? I mean, 2016, 2017, it was the rage. Everyone was talking about electric vehicles. No one could stop talking about it. The one Tesla that got imported and, and had to pay a, a big tax in Singapore made the news. But it took five years after that for people to actually start seeing Teslas on the road. And we are only now seeing that happen. Right. Uh, and, and that's for an industry that already had a lot of money invested in it, that already had the technology that was tried and tested. So for you to be able to get, you know, themes like the metaverse to really start showing in terms of investments will take time. So patience is the key. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing is to just figure out who's doing what. And I, I think given how much of a fad it is today, there's plenty of research out there. Um, I mean, Matthew Ball is is considered a guru globally. Um, so I think he's got a he's got a blog. Uh, MatthewBall.vc is his his website. I think um, you know he should pay me for this. But uh, he, he, he's he, that's a great stop for you to just get a sense of what's happening, who's doing what, what are the moving parts, etc. Um, and and that, that will give you a bit more sense of how you want to look at the space. Um, and, and finally, I mean, there are plenty of um, uh, exchange traded funds available if you want to invest in the metaverse. I mean, there are two or three listed in Hong Kong, uh, including one of ours, a shameless plug there. Uh, but there are also a, a few that are listed in the US. Um, so whatever suits your fancy. Yeah, no, I think you, you talked a little bit about, you know, resources that people can can actually kind of tune into. So this is obviously a very new topic to a lot of people, right? So, and there is a lot of noise in the market. You see on Twitter, you see yeah. on Reddit everywhere. So what are some of the resources people can actually really rely on other than, other than the one that you just mentioned? Anything else? I mean, the, the, the big uh, tech companies are all involved in the metaverse, right? I mean, Facebook has changed its name. So obviously they are involved in the metaverse. Uh, Microsoft is doing a lot of stuff. Uh, Apple is doing a lot of stuff. Um, so those are the big ones. I mean, Sony, for the first time in their investment, they talked about launching a PlayStation Virtual, um, which which uh, is supposedly coming out at the end of this year. Uh, and, and Sony obviously has a, a, a massive stable of uh, content as well to go on to that virtual world. Um, so just follow what these big companies are doing, because a lot of this investment will be sizable. And a lot of this requires a whole bunch of different parts of the of the industry to come together and work in one direction, which is very difficult for a small company to do. Uh, so you need large companies to put impetus behind something like that. Um, so an easy starting point is just look at the big tech names and see what they're doing in the space and, and you'll get a sense of uh, where the action is. But there are a lot, lot of blogs as well. Sounds good. And you mentioned earlier that Nico also just launched an ETF around uh, yeah. this particular theme, right? So for investors that are looking to, I guess, get exposure to the metaverse and they're considering investing directly in companies versus an ETF, like the, the one that Nico has, you know, which, you know, what are some of the things they should consider? I mean, would just make sense in general, ETFs are always a good option. Uh, I mean, um, so one of the ETFs, uh, so one way to look at metaverse as a whole is just look at gaming as a starting point. Um, uh, gaming globally is considered like, a, 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 if you will, a ramp onto the metaverse uh, because that's the most intuitive and it's easy to gamify anything. Um, so that's your first sort of interactive layer. Um, so you can start with gaming companies and, and, and you know, move from there. Um, so we actually have a gaming ETF uh, right now um, and, and that's one part of it. Um, the other way to look at it is um, besides just ETFs, I mean, if you're really keen and, and you've got the money and, uh, you know, this will, uh, goes back to what uh, Bertram and Freddie were talking about in terms of private equity or venture capital, there is a lot happening in this space in Asia, uh, in the VC space, in the private equity space. I am personally not that well informed, and and you know, Nico as a as a house are not involved in the private equity or VC space. Uh, but I'm sure you know if you're if you're of that bent, there there is there is ample activity there. Sounds good. I'm just mindful of time now. I think we've gone uh, past the hour mark. Sure. So thank I, I'm just going to, I guess, get everyone to quickly thank Ashwin for sharing thank with you. us the insights on the metaverse today. Thank you so much, Ashwin. Thank you. Thank uh, you and much. thank you all so much for tuning on, uh, tuning in online as well. Uh, we have representatives from, from Stashway and Nico here. If you have any questions, feel free to approach any of us. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a, a great evening here. Yeah, Thank I was you, just going to say, you know, uh, the other day the Wi-Fi died and I met, I saw my family for the first time and they're all quite likable people, right? So now you can do that in the metaverse and you don't have to wait for the Wi-Fi to die. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you very much. Yes.